Yep. Awesome. Alrighty. So um, I think we're ready to begin. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm likely not a familiar face here yet, so I'll introduce myself. I'm Alex Solomon, the new communications and outreach coordinator at Santa Lucia Conservancy. I started in May and came down from Portland where I worked for a salmon and steelhead conservation nonprofit. I earned my bachelor's degree from Lewis and Clark College in environmental studies and pre-law. And my goals for this newly created position are to host interactive and educational events like this one, uh, increase our online presence, build partnerships with like-minded organizations, and design materials for preserved members to dive deeper into what it means to be a conservation community. Now I'd like to introduce our honored guest and host of this ecology talk, Dr. Jen Hunter. Dr. Hunter is currently the director of the Hastings Natural History Reservation a biological field station of the University of California, Berkeley. Hastings is one of the oldest field stations in the world, operating since 1937 on 2,500 acres in the Santa Lucia mountain range. Uh, Dr. Hunter has a BS in wildlife science from the University of Washington and a PhD in ecology from UC Davis. She has studied dolphins, cheetahs, and lemurs in the wild, but her favorite study animal is by far the striped skunk. We're incredibly excited to welcome Dr. Hunter and learn more about her work with this crafty species that makes itself so well known on the preserve. Without further ado, please take it away, Dr. Hunter. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just share um, my screen here so we can Perfect. get going. Um, and you'll have to tell me, I've had problems in the past with people seeing the comments version? Are you seeing the whole one? Are you seeing the one with the notes or are you seeing the regular like presentation? I'm seeing the regular one. Perfect. Okay. Um, so yeah, so I'm Jen. I'm the director at the Hastings Reserve. So um, I know we're a bit far away from you guys. We're at the 26 mile mark of Carmel Valley Road. So we're in the upper watershed. Um, Hastings, as, as Alex mentioned, Hastings has been a field station since 1937. Um, I've only been here for a couple of years, so I'm sort of a new member of the greater Carmel River Valley community. Um, but I worked at, I'll, I'm not gonna talk about the reserve network today, um, but so Hastings is one of 41 biological field stations that the University of California owns and operates. And they're located all throughout the state and all of our different um, biomes and our uh, various geographic areas. Um, and Hastings is the oldest in our network and one of the oldest field stations in the world. So it was established originally to be a place for research and education. Um, and then recently we've kind of expanded that to really focus a lot on outreach and community engagement because to me specifically, that's a really important part of what we do here. And the value that we bring to the community is to be able to communicate the research that's happening here and the importance of the work that's done here um, to our community. So um, you, some of you may have caught one of my skunk talks. I've been giving them all throughout the valley in the last couple of years. Um, I studied striped skunks um, as a grad student and I'll talk a little bit about sort of the, the interesting part of the skunk to me. Um, I'll talk a little bit about basic ecology and biology, but I'm really going to focus on this incredible anti-predator adaptation that they have, which is their coloration paired with that. What's I guess science jargon is noxious anal secretion, which I suppose is <laughs> as cleaned up a version um, as you can get. But it's what they, what we have in the striped skunk is this really elegant sort of evolution story. Um, and one of the things I think that makes them such a great sort of ambassador of ecology and evolution is that we see them everywhere. So everybody knows skunks, everybody's had an experience with skunks. Um, I can give a talk in Oakland, California. I can give a talk in Carmel Valley and everybody has seen a skunk and knows a skunk. So we're starting at kind of the same level in terms of basic understanding of what these guys look like and where they are. Um, and I think that after I've indoctrinated all of you, um, you'll be able to look at them with sort of a new level of respect. Um, so I'll start with the basics. Um, so this is the order carnivora. Um, the taxonomic order carnivora. Um, for years and years and years, skunks were considered part of the mustelid um, family um, or order or suborder. They are not. Um, they are their own family called Mephididae. So they are um, sort of closely aligned with your mustelids, like your weasels and your badgers and your procyonids, like um, 
raccoons, but they're their own taxonomic family. And there's 13 members of the family Mephididae. Uh, all of them are found in the New World, except these two up here. Um, these are called stink badgers, um, and they're found in Java, Sumatra, Indonesia, um, those areas. Uh, everybody else is found in the New World. We have two species here in California. We have the familiar striped skunk and the less familiar, arguably more interesting spotted skunk. Um, and so these guys are pretty different in terms of body size. So that's one of the things that makes the sort of striped skunk versus spotted skunk story pretty interesting. Um, so a good sized striped skunk will weigh about 11 to 12 pounds. A good sized spotted skunk weighs about a pound and a half. So they're about the size of a ground squirrel. So they're quite, quite small. Um, both species are omnivorous. They kind of eat whatever they can find. Um, they're not big hunters. They don't have great eyesight. So they kind of amble around, they dig. They, a lot of times people will see evidence of them digging in their lawns, um, looking for grubs and insects. Um, they'll eat lizards if they can catch them. They'll raid birds' nests. They're actually a really important nest predator for waterfowl. So um, a lot of the work that's been done around striped skunks in particular has been focused on the impacts that, that they have as nest predators of um, ducks and geese and things like that. Um, predators is a big question mark. We'll talk about that later on, uh, but they're both sort of habitat generalists. They live in all sorts of places. They're really readily adaptable. So they'll live in cities. They can live in really rural areas. They can live in agricultural areas. Um, and they're just like consummate survivors. So they typically do quite well in most places. Um, so I think it's important to mention that unlike a lot of animals of this body size of this sort of guild position. So, and by that, I mean sort of these small to medium sized carnivores. Predation is not an important part of skunk mortality. So most skunk mortality comes from starvation and disease. Um, there are, I spent a lot of time, as one can imagine when you're writing a dissertation that includes skunks um, and you're looking at predation and risk of predation, um, one reads a lot of papers. And I have not yet encountered a paper on skunks that shows that they under are under any significant predator pressure. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about <clears throat> their ecology, although I've cut some things out of my slide. So maybe I'll actually, I'll just go into it now. Um, so skunks typically, most of the work that's been done with striped skunks has been done in the Midwest and the High Plains and in Canada. And in these locations specifically, there are really, really harsh winters. Um, and so what skunks do, striped skunks, is that they will den communally to sort of um, stay warm and things like that when the weather is really extreme. Um, and what happens when they do this is that they essentially, they get in this big cuddle puddle and they spend all this time together and then they just transmit disease back and forth between individuals. And then those individuals go and they, they um, will den with other animals the next night. And so you can imagine how disease can kind of move through a population um, and have some pretty significant impacts. Um, we don't know quite as much about spotted skunks. They're relatively understudied. There's a subpopulation on the um, Channel Islands that's fairly well studied, but it's almost like a predator-free island. There are, they're in competition with island foxes, but, um, and they do have some predator pressure from raptors, but it's not sort of your typical um, sort of California predator guild that they're living within. So a lot of the work that, that's been done there, um, we kind of have to take that stuff with a grain of salt because it's not sort of um, your normal intact sort of California predator guild. Um, so the breeding season for both of these guys is a little bit off. So striped skunks, their breeding season is February to March. You'll notice when there's a lot of roadkill skunks on the road, it'll be fed that in that time period. Um, they're not particularly territorial. So oftentimes animals will be traveling looking for mates, which is why they get hit on the road um, as often. Um, spotted skunks, their breeding season is September, uh, but babies are not born until May. They have this really unique system of delayed implantation where the, the fertilized blastocysts will kind of float around inside the uterus um, and eventually implant on um, the uterine wall in April. So it's a real funny system. I don't know that there's a real explanation for why that happens, but that seems to be the case. Um, one question that I get all the time is how soon can they spray? Um, and so uh, 
it's pretty soon. For striped skunks, it's within eight days, but they really don't know what they're doing. They're just kind of randomly spraying. Um, we don't know how soon spotted skunks can spray. It takes them about a month to two to be able to kind of spray directionally. Um, and you can imagine what life in the den must be um, wow. after a couple of weeks. Um, they don't hit sexual maturity until almost a year old. And the lifespan is quite short, again, because of this impact of disease on these populations. Most skunks in the striped skunks in the wild only live one to two years. Um, and so and we don't, again, we don't really know for spotted skunks. You'd be surprised to learn that skunks are difficult species to study. Um, and so, um, you know, we definitely could know more about um, their basic ecology. And a lot of the work that's been done, again, has been happening in a very, a couple of very small geographic areas and it's very few studies in number. So um, I would love to know what's happening in California with skunks, particularly because we don't have these harsh seasonal winters. Um, it may be possible that disease is not such an important factor here. Um, so I'll leave it at that. It's also worth um, noting that the babies are like insanely cute. Um, they have these big giant heads and they're an absolute delight. I ran into a mother and five babies on the road here. I say ran into, I did not hit them. I encountered them on the road. Um, and they just make the most spectacular little cooing sound. And they follow the mom around really close, like tuck in right behind her. It was a delight. Um, and then it's also important to know that their coloration is on their skin. So even when they're days old and they haven't fully furred out, um, you can see sort of the color pattern that they will eventually have. Um, it's kind of a long video, but I'm going to play as much as I can, as you can tolerate. Um, so we all are familiar with this scenario, um, skunk versus dog. I'll just note that while the video is playing, that the tomato sauce as a skunk spray treatment is not effective. Um, it causes something that's called olfactory exhaustion, where your whole nasal system basically shuts down. Um, and so there's actually a recipe online that sort of degrades the protein in the spray that causes the smell. So if anybody has a pet that's sprayed by a skunk, um, you can just Google skunk spray recipe um, and you'll get it. It's hydrogen peroxide and baking soda and um, dish soap. So the reason I show this video is so you can see how long it takes for a skunk to spray. Um, so this fool is recording his dog harassing the skunk. The skunk doesn't really have anywhere to go. There's some body of water on this side. The dog's getting quite close and that's it. So we're like a minute into the video and this dog's finally been sprayed. And so we're all, many of us are also familiar with the aftermath here um, of the rubbing on the ground and the general canine misery. Um, and then the last thing to kind of note here is that when we come back to our little skunky friend, it's just standing there. Like it's not, it feels like it's delivered the message it came to deliver. Um, and it doesn't feel particularly afraid or um, nervous and it's not taking this opportunity to escape. Um, and, uh, and that's something that we'll come back to in a minute. Um, so, you know, skunks can be challenging neighbors. Uh, I hear a lot from people who have skunks that are living under their porches or in their backyards. Um, there's not much you can do about it, frankly, but uh, they're delightful in many ways. Um, so they're really great for rodent control and insect pest control. Um, there's the adorable factor, which is wonderful. Um, and then also we'll talk about, they're not particularly afraid of things. And so they're actually really easy to observe. And so if, I mean, it takes a little bit of stomach to stand there and watch one walk past you, knowing what can happen if things go awry, but um, they're actually really, really easy to watch. And they're, it's easy to watch them doing things, foraging for food, moving around. Um, and in a way that most wildlife um, it's easier to observe them than most other wildlife that we have out here. They're not particularly scared of us. Um, on the con side, there's the nuisance spraying, which frankly lies mostly at fault of the dogs um, because the skunks are just trying to live their lives and the dogs can't handle it. 
Um, and then there's this whole infectious disease element that I talked about um, when they done communally. And it's just a really long list of infectious diseases. It's viral diseases, it's um, fungal diseases, it's bacterial stuff, they're parasites. They can be a real vector of the nasty stuff. Um, but, you know, again, offset by the cuteness maybe, I don't know, we'll see. Um, and so the stuff that I'm gonna focus on uh, so when I did my research on skunks, I was focused on intra-guild competition and predation in carnivores. And that's kind of a fancy way of thinking about how you have all of these species of carnivores. So you've got things from the size of a weasel to the size of a bear. They're all living in the same area. They're all basically trying to eat the same stuff. Um, and how do these animals adapt to these circumstances where they're basically at risk um, from larger predators while they're trying to find their own prey. Um, and uh, so I, I really honed in on this visual communication. So skunks have this very unique visual system, um, it, or I'm not visual, uh, they're this very unique appearance that has to exploit the visual system of other animals that they encounter in their environment. Um, so there are two sort of broadly types of visual communication. Um, what the first is intraspecific. And so that's when an animal is trying to communicate visually with members of its same species. So for example, a bull elk might use the big body size and the big rack of antlers to communicate with a female elk that it's a really good uh, potential mate. And there's also this interspecific communication, which I think is trickier. So that same bull elk could use that body size and that rack of antlers to communicate with a pack of wolves and say, it's unwise for you to attack me because I'm so well defended um, and I'm so large. And this is the stuff that I think is really interesting because you essentially have two species that are on their own sort of evolutionary trajectory um, that have to be able to communicate with one another and understand those signals that are being communicated. Um, and so, uh, so one of the, the types of signals that can be community, communicated are these things called signals of unprofitability. And so by unprofitability, I mean basically what you would, like if you're in a business that's unprofitable, it means that you're not making enough to cover your costs. Um, and so signals of unprofitability are signals that prey can use to communicate with their potential predators and say that the cost to pursue me, catch me, kill me, the energetic cost of that activity is gonna be greater than the benefit that you receive from eating me. So it's basically trying to work out that, like those uh, help predators work out the math about um, how valuable these animals are as potential food items. So there's a couple of different ways that that happens. One is that animals can demonstrate to their potential predators that they're difficult to catch. So the top image there is a greater kudu. They have this white bar between their eyes. And so if a predator who relies on stealth to hunt sees that white bar, they realize that that animal is looking at them and that they've already kind of lost that fight. Like they're not, they haven't successfully stalked anybody. They've been discovered. Um, and then the bottom panel, that's a Thompson's gazelle. And they do this really familiar um, locomotion technique called stodding, where they jump straight up in the air with all four feet off the ground at the same time. It looks ridiculous. It's a super inefficient way to travel. Um, but what it does is communicate to a potential predator that I have so much energy that I'm willing to do this ridiculous jump to show you how strong I am and how fast I am. Um, and it would be really unwise for you to try to pursue me. Um, and there was actually a study done on Thompson's gazelle looking at um, when they started, if cheetahs were more or less likely to pursue them. And the researcher found that cheetahs almost never pursued um, Thompson's gazelle that were starting. And when they did, they rarely caught them. So it signal seems to kind of work at least with cheetahs. Uh, another example is um, this coloration pattern that shows predators that the prey is noxious in some way. So we can think of poison dart frogs and all of these sort of brightly colored animals um, that use that bright coloration to communicate with their potential predators that they're dangerous um, or poisonous in some way. So we have a, a poisonous frog from the Congo in that top panel. Um, and then the bottom is a streaked tenric from Madagascar. Um, and they have these um, sort of spines all over their bodies, kind of like a hedgehog, um, and they have a toxin in their skin. And then we have communication that prey is dangerous. So on this top panel, we have 
a honey badger. Um, and these guys have what's called hyperaggression, where they will attack animals well beyond their own body size. They've been known to attack people on horseback. They'll attack car tires. They weigh about 30 pounds. So they're pretty small animals, but they're ferocious. Um, and then the bottom here, we have a, a African crested porcupine. They have these black and white quills that they'll do this thing called stridulation where they kind of rub the quills together and they make a sound. Um, and then they erect those quills if they're being threatened by something. Um, and then, so this is the stuff I'm gonna talk about. So this sort of, we broadly term it warning coloration, but it's the specific color patterns that serve to warn a potential predator that an animal is dangerous or noxious in some way. And so, but if you look at throughout nature, all of these examples of animals that are noxious, you'll see some common attributes. So we have our ladybug, which is toxic. Um, we have these nudibranchs down here, which are these sort of sea slugs that are toxic. Um, sea snakes, poison dart frogs, there's two species of tenrec here. Um, and then we have our hyper-aggressive honey badgers, our bees. All of these guys have this sort of warning coloration. Of course, we have our, our friendly neighborly uh, striped skunk here. Um, and so what's common to all of these species? So it's, it's about coloration and it's about contrast. So we have black and red, black and white, black and yellow, uh, black and green, but it's kind of a, it's a very bright sort of almost fluorescent green. Um, and it's basically, um, you know, it's a sort of same idea that skunks are using, right? So they have this black and whiteness that's so distinctive and it's really easy to see during the day and it's also easy to see at night. And we'll talk about in a minute why that's so important, but they're not unique. So there are lots of species of mammals that have this warning coloration, this black and white coloration. So, um, and then there's some really incredible examples of this idea of convergent evolution where you have animals that are not particularly closely related taxonomically, um, but they have kind of evolved to have these common characteristics um, that all are sort of communicating the same thing. So on the left, we have a European badger. On the right in the, is an American badger. Um, both of these species have their warning coloration on their faces, which is important to think about how badgers live in the world and the fossorial. So they spend a lot of time underground. And so when a potential predator encounters them, um, oftentimes they will encounter them face first. And so it's really important to get that warning message out there early. Uh, we have these two species. So on the right is a honey badger. On the left is a species called a greater grisson. They're found in South America. So honey badger is in Africa, east, Eastern and Southern Africa. A grisson is in South America. Um, grissons also have that sort of hyper-aggressive personality type. And you can see how similarly they look. Um, and then here are three species. On the left is our western spotted skunk. In the middle is a species called a Libyan polecat. And on the right is a species that's found in West Africa called the Zorilla. Um, they're all of similar body size. Um, so again, like the skunk is a member of the family Mephididae. These two are Mustelids. So they're not even in the same taxonomic family, but you can see how similar their coloration is. If you look at the face of the Zorilla, and the face of the spotted skunk, they're almost indistinguishable. We have our another species of tenrec here and our porcupine again. And then we have our two sort of weirdos. So this is called a maned rat. Um, they're also found in West Africa. They, are, they have these hollow hairs on their body that they will chew, it's very complicated, but they will chew the bark of a tree that's toxic. And then they will lick these hollow hairs they have and basically anoint themselves with this toxin. And then if they're attacked by something that bites them, that animal can be poisoned by the toxin from the bark that they have anointed on their fur. Um, and then this last one here, this is one of those other um, mephitids that's called a, a stink badger. So that's what we're dealing with in Indonesia. This is like the skunk cousin um, in Indonesia. Uh, and so what do these guys all have in common? We have this black and white coloration, which is pretty critical. Um, and we also have something that's called, uh, in many of these species, that's called reverse countershading. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and one thing that's important to think about is why black and white. So I showed you those pictures of all of these other species. We've got black and yellow, black and red, black and green. Um, all of these animals are nocturnal. Um, and so we have two types of photoreceptors in our eyes. We have rods and we have cones. Um, cones are responsible for color vision, 
and they don't operate in low light conditions. And so it, you'll notice as dusk is falling that there's a period where sort of all of the colors kind of get mashed up together. So you kind of lose the ability to differentiate visually between green and brown and black and um, all the other sort of colors that exist around us um, in the natural world. And so um, black and white is really a valuable tool when you're a nocturnal animal and you're trying to communicate. So it's about color, both because black and white is really easy to see and it's about contrast because that contrast is easy to see even when your rods or your cones aren't working and um, you're just dealing with essentially black and white vision. And so when a predator is hunting, there's a whole sequence of activity that has to happen. There are a whole bunch of decisions that have to be made. Um, and so the first thing that happens, so if a bobcat's hunting a hare, it's got to see the hare and it's got to identify what it is as a potential prey species. And then from there, it has to decide whether or not it's going to approach and pursue that hare. And then it's got to catch it and it's got to eat it. So that's kind of the predatory sequence that happens, you know, if a predator is looking for something to eat. And so if a predator is looking for a skunk, it's the same process, right? So it sees it and then identifies it. But then what happens? It makes the decision, no, this isn't something that's worth pursuing. So nine times out of 10, if a predator, the further along that a predator gets in that sequence above, the more likely they are to pursue that animal until it, they catch it or it gets away. And so from a skunk's perspective, it's really important to be able to communicate that you're noxious or dangerous in some way as early on in that process as you can. Um, and this happens through a couple of different ways. So first, skunks are really detectable. So these are two images from Hastings that were taken on the same day at the same camera. Um, and you can see the difference in terms of being able to visually differentiate a skunk from the surrounding vegetation compared to a bobcat from the surrounding vegetation. So a bobcat is cryptically colored. They're trying to hunt their food. They want to sneak up on it. They don't want to be easy to see. Um, for a skunk, it's really important that they are detectable and that a potential prey or a predator can detect them really, really early in that predatory sequence. They also have to be discriminable, which means they're significantly different from the other species that are of the same size that they share the world with. So, you know, a, a gray fox and a striped skunk represent almost the same size meal to a potential predator, uh, but they look very, very different. Skunks or um, foxes are cryptically colored. They have these, this long, these long legs and a long tail. Skunks have this really distinctive body plan and they have that really, really, really easy to see contrasting black and white coloration. And the third element is that they're memorable. So research, research has shown that animals that have previous bad experiences with warning colored species tend to avoid warning colored species in the future. Um, and the classic example of that is a study that was done in the 60s using blue jays and um, monarch butterflies. So monarchs eat milkweed, uh, which builds up the silica in their body, so they are toxic. And so they took hand-reared blue jays who had never seen a monarch before and fed them monarch butterflies, which the jays were happy to eat the first time around. Um, and then they got quite sick. And they, this is a, on the right, that's what a bird looks like when it throws up. Um, and then they gave, they offered these same birds monarchs and the second time, and they were not enthused at all, even when they were starving um, about eating these monarchs. Um, and so if you think about where we are and how we're surrounded all the time by these animals that do these different things in the ecosystem. So you start with your grasses and your forbs and, um, and those, those, Organisms serve as food for your sort of grazers, like your deer, your hare, your squirrels. Um, those animals are in turn consumed by this whole suite of predators that exist around us. And then one thing that's often left out is that the sort of medium sized predators are in turn eaten by the larger predators. Um, so there's lots of, there are lots of examples of mountain lions and coyotes and bears eating things like raccoons and bobcats and even coyotes. Um, but you'll notice we have this guy here who we've talked about um, who doesn't really get eaten by anybody. Um, and so there have been a couple of studies that have evaluated um, sort of how skunks perceive the world and how nervous they are um, around these species like coyotes that could potentially eat them. So this was a study that was done 
um, a couple of years ago, looking at how skunks respond to the sort of artificially increased coyote presence on the landscape. So the researcher was playing um, coyote howls, they were spraying coyote urine all over the place, basically trying to create an environment where a sort of skunk passing through might think, oh my god, there's a coyote situation happening here. Um, and so what the researcher found was that coyote, or skunks did not appreciably significantly change their behavior in the presence of um, howls and, and coyote urine. Um, and it was a pretty intense application. I think the, um, the howls were, took place for um, one minute every hour, every night for a week. So um, it was a pretty intense sort of coyote situation and there was no response from the skunks. And similarly, they didn't change how they ranged through the landscape um, in proximity to these um, various coyote cues that were out there. Um, and then the other thing I'll just mention, um, usually when I give skunk talks, there's somebody, when we, back when we could like be together in the same room, um, people would say, but what about owls? So great horn owls are sort of this legendary skunk predator, skunk specialist. Um, and it undoubtedly happens. So here's a great horn owl. Um, and this is a Molina's hognose skunk that it is halfway through eating. This picture is from Argentina. Um, it was actually published as a note in a journal in 2016 because it's so uncommon to actually have evidence of great horned owls eating skunks. Um, so there's a, been a couple of really notable studies um, and there are undoubtedly owls that are skunk specialists, but the cost to owls is potentially quite high. So um, oftentimes people will tell you, but owls can't smell, so the skunk spray doesn't bother them. Um, and that's true. Um, but it's not the smell that's the problem with skunk spray. It's essentially like a chemical burn. Um, and so this uh, below, I realize it's insanely small writing, but this was a note that was written up um, in a journal talking about um, some great horned owls that were brought in um, to wildlife rehab facilities. And so I worked at a wildlife rehab facility when I was in college, um, and we certainly got great horned owls that smelled skunky. Um, but if you think about why these animals come in, it's because they're incapacitated in some way. So I'll just read a little bit of this. Um, so this is, a, they're discussing five owls that were found and brought into rehab facilities between 1976 and 1978. Um, all of the birds smelled strongly of skunk scent and four of them were emaciated. Their eyes had a clouded experience, or appearance and their vision appeared to be impaired, possibly indicating that the birds had received part of the skunk spray in the face. In addition, discoloration of the feathers on the breast and face was apparent on some of the owls, probably caused by contact with the spray of the skunks. All five, all five owls were found on or near roads and could be easily approached. One of the owls, which was not emaciated, had puncture wounds in, in, on the breast and abdomen and died a day after it was found. Um, four of the owls were treated for dehydration and emaciation. The owl with the puncture wounds was treated um, with antibiotics, yada, yada. Two of the owls died and three were released having fully recovered. So what that tells me is so these owls were found on a road, right? On or near a road. And if they, if some good Samaritan hadn't stopped and picked those owls up, what might've happened to them, right? They would have been eaten by something else. They would have been hit by a car. And so when you're an owl and you rely on your sight to be able to protect yourself and to feed yourself, it is a major problem if you're sprayed in the face by a skunk and that degrades your eyes sight to such an extent that you're unable to protect yourself. Um, and there's a classic paper that was published in the early 90s, late 80s, where someone found a great horned owl nest that had like 50 skunk skeletons in it. So there are undoubtedly specialists. Um, but I, in all of my reading, never found an owl study where skunk was a, skunks were a significant part of great horned owl diets. I never found a skunk study where owls were a significant source of predator mortality. So it's a controversial thing to say. I'm just going to put it out there. Um, and actually the other skunk biologists that I know, and frankly, it's a very small number of us, um, you know, that's the thing that we all gnash our teeth to, um, the great horned owls, you know, like every time we try to talk about skunks, the owls situation comes up. 
I'm just gonna say, those of you that have bird, birder friends, you're avid birders yourself, just try it, try it. Try saying that owls don't eat skunks and see what happens. It can be a pretty risky move, but uh, I feel good about it. Um, so I'm gonna show you guys a bunch of videos now. Um, and there's a couple of things that are worth noting. So skunks have two different elements to their um, sort of anti-predator signal that they use. So first is kind of a passive signal. It's just the way that they look. They have this black body with the white markings. They have that reverse counter shading. So I'll just um, mention that, so that black and white coloration, the blackness being on the bottom. So most animals, if you think about deer, you think about bobcats, you think about mountain lions, they're darker on top than they are underneath. So their bellies are lighter color. And what that does is it helps break up the body shape and it helps an animal, particularly when they're moving in and out of sun and shade, um, they're not that easy to differentiate from the background. This reverse counter shading, the, the darker on the bottom than they are on top, makes them easier to see in the landscape than they otherwise would be. And so that's a really, really important component of their signal. And that's one of those things that you'll see in those other species, um, mammal species that have warning coloration. Um, the second part of the skunk signal is this active part. So the first thing that they do is they put their tail up, um, they'll stomp their feet, charge toward whatever they're trying to display out and rake the ground. Um, striped skunks will do this sort of partial handstand. Spotted skunks do this full handstand, which is spectacular. Um, and generally speaking, it works super, super well. So I'm gonna show you a couple of videos that help um, to demonstrate this. So this is obviously not a native predator, it is a llama, um, but you can see that tail goes up and the skunk does a charge and it continues. And then it just like goes about its business and does its thing. So that's it, right? Like that, we're, most of us are familiar with that um, whole routine. Um, but uh, it's important to think about how well it works, right? So, so here is a coyote and a skunk. Again, skunks have terrible eyesight, so it takes a second. There's that raking the ground, the tail's up, another rake of the ground, and then it's just a run. And it works really, really well. A cool video too, because, so this is a deer carcass here, a mountain lion feeding. You can see the tail of the skunk. So that mountain lion's at the head side of the deer. Um, the skunk is at the tail side. Um, and this is kind of, and the mountain lion is clearly focused on the, the deer at this point. You can see it putting its head down, trying to eat. And the skunk comes up, sprays it. Mountain lion takes off. And then the skunk has this incredible uncontested meal. So, you know, we think about skunks using their spray in a purely defensive situation, but it's certainly possible that they can use that spray to, to benefit them in terms of feeding opportunities too. Um, and then this one, so this is a video is from Colorado. Um, so we have a black bear here and you'll see behind this bear, um, a tail. I mean, and so we're talking about a body size differential in terms of orders of magnitude. Um, and I mean, I, striped skunks are potentially the most behaviorally dominant carnivore in the Americas. So they can take on animals 10 times their body size, more than that. I mean, if this is an 11 pound skunk and this is a 200 pound bear, um, you know, it's a massive difference in body size. Um, and they continually have success in protecting themselves and their resources against these animals that are so much larger than they are. Um, this story would not be complete without our stripe, our spotted skunk. So this has all been striped skunk. Um, spotted skunks and their incredible handstands. Let's see if I can make this thing play. Um, so they just kind of kick up. This was our video from here. You can see, can I just talk about my process here? I'm just gonna move this guy out of the way. So there's another camera here. I got one spotted skunk on this camera and decided that this was going to be like a photo booth. And I had like 12 cameras set up in this one area hoping to catch exactly this, um, which is why there's a camera taking the video and also another camera in the background. Um, but so they do this handstand and we have this 
boop of the snoot there, which is also lovely. Um, from further away, this is what it looks like. So they do this handstand. So the head of the spotted skunk is down here at the bottom. We have the feet out to the side here. They can spray from this posture. They'll basically bend their back forward and spray over their tail. So they'll stay in a handstand position while they spray. Um, and while they're super small, again, the size of a ground squirrel, um, they're just as ferocious as their larger cousins. So we have bobcat here, spotted skunk, chasing the bobcat. Uh, their eyes are glowing because this is an infrared flash on the camera, so which is actually really helpful because it helps you be able to um, see these animals at a distance that eye shine. So this is, you know, minutes later, Bobcat's back up here just trying to live its life. Spotted skunk is not into it. So Bobcat runs down, spotted skunk still chasing it, still chasing it. Um, you know, they're just tenacious. And um, there's, a, there's another, um, this is not such a great video. Um, this is from a research study that was up in, I think it was Mendocino County. Um, so it's a mountain lion with a GPS collar on it. Um, and the researchers were watching the video. They see that she stops feeding and moves off. Um, and this was from several years ago, so the resolution is not great. Um, but you'll see in this area, this little tail crop up at some point here. Um, let's see, oh, there it is. So you can see this little thing right here is a tail. Um, and that is the tail of a spotted skunk. So this is a, you know, 120 pound mountain lion being pushed around by a one and a half pound um, spotted skunk. And so the mountain lion was pushed off the kill, spotted skunk fed, mountain lion came back and continued to feed. Spotted skunk came back again, pushed it off for a second time and was able to feed again. Um, and so why does this work quite so well? And I'm gonna brace you all for the semi-shocking photo that's coming. Um, this is why. So they have this incredible chemical defense that they use against their predators. Um, there's actually a slow motion video of a skunk spraying from about this close um, that if you're interested, you should watch. It's horrifying, so I couldn't, I can't in good faith put it in a lecture, but um, essentially there are two walnut sizes on a striped skunk there are two walnut sized glands inside the anus and they have these two nozzles that can kind of come out and like pew 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 like spray skunk spray um they can adjust the nozzle a bit so it can either be sprayed as a direct stream or it can be sprayed as kind of an atomized mist and so depending on how close their potential predator is to them um, they can adjust that spray to do the most damage. Um, they can spray consistently about 15 feet with good accuracy. Um, and if the wind is in their favor, um, they can spray up to 30 feet. Um, there are two key ingredients in this. There are seven volatile components of the spray, um, but the two key ingredients are called thiols and, and thiol acetates. Um, so the thiols are um, the smelly part. Um, but then the thiol acetates, when they are hydrolyzed with water, they become thiols. So essentially, if any of you have had a pet that's been sprayed by a skunk, if you hit a skunk with your car, um, you wash that animal, you wash your car, enough time goes by, you feel like you've dealt with the smell, um, and then it rains, and everything gets wet, and the remnant thiol acetates will hydrolyze and then start smelling again like the day it happened. Um, they bond really well with the proteins in your skin. And so if you get sprayed or you get the spray on you, it's really, really hard to get that off. Um, the symptoms are similar to tear gas, it's nausea, vomiting, temporary blindness. It's one of, and it's one of the easiest sort of chemical compounds for humans to detect at low concentration. So we can detect skunk spray at about 10 parts per billion. Um, it's similar to um, the chemical when you cut an onion that makes your eyes water. Um, and also the smell of natural gas. So natural gas doesn't naturally have an odor, um, but after uh, there was an explosion at a school in the 1930s, I think. Um, and, uh, and since that time, it's, uh, municipalities require that the smell be added to natural gas because it's so easy for us to detect. Um, and this vial here on the right uh, has water and skunk spray in it. 
um, and it's heavier than water. So it actually, so this is water at the top and the spray is at the bottom. But the consistency, it's not thick and oily and weird. It's very, it's almost like consistency of like a vinegar. It's very, very thin. Um, let's see, let's go. I've lost control of my slides here. Oh, there we go. Um, and this is uh, just to give you an idea of another option uh, for how skunk spray works. Um, this is an article that was written in 1881. Um, the, the, the article is called A New Rival of Chloroform and Ether. And I'll just read a little passage from that. Um, sometime during the summer of 1879, two or three boys secured a two ounce bottle from the perfume of the skunk or pole cat and concluded to play a trick upon one of their schoolmates. Entering his room, they held him and administered the above, the above nauseous fluid in its most concentrated form by inhalation. I could not ascertain what amount had been administered. However, when I, when I reached him, I found the following symptoms. A total unconsciousness, relaxation of the muscular system, extremities cool, pupils natural, breathing normal, pulse 65, temperature 94, in which condition he remained for one hour. So if anybody ends up in kind of an apocalyptic type scenario and you need general anesthetic and you don't have one available to you, there's an option here. Um, and I do appreciate also that one of the uh, passages in this article, just to show you where we are as a society compared to where we were, um, it says, we publish the above with the hopes of inducing ambitious young students to make further experiments on themselves and report the results. Um, so just an option for folks out there who are looking for something to do. Um, I'm almost uh, done. I, I want to just make a, a point about something that I tried to do, which was unwise, um, but further demonstrates the effectiveness of skunk spray. So I decided I was going to do an experiment looking at how the concentration of skunk spray um, the impact of that on potential predators. So if you were a fur trapper, you might buy a, car a carnivore lure to try to attract other carnivores. Nine times out of 10, a commercial carnivore lure is gonna include some component of skunk or skunk anal glands because that smell at low concentration is really attractive to other species. At high concentration, it's a completely different animal. So I was went upset about collecting skunk spray from roadkill skunks. So I found this female on Carmel Valley Road. I collected this spray, which was way more than I was anticipating. I knew when I was doing it, I should have a respirator on. I've given this talk 100,000 times. I knew I should have a respirator on. I knew I should have more protective equipment. Um, I chose not to do any of those things. Um, and when you pass like a skunk that's been hit by a car, that smell, is not horrible. I mean, it's very skunky and very distinctive, but it doesn't make you regret anything. Um, when you encounter it in your face, it's it gets in your throat, it gets in your nose. I tasted skunk and smelled skunk for like three days after doing this. And I hadn't even been sprayed. I was just breathing the fumes. Um, I essentially manually extracted the spray from the skunk and you can imagine what that looked like um and then i poured it into this test tube uh, i had a lot of regrets almost immediately um i smelled like skunk for days um the reserve smelled like skunk for days but i thought all right well lesson learned um i'm just going to do my little experiment with this stuff and it'll be fine um storage also became a problem so i put this thing in a freezer i wrapped it in three plastic bags put it in the freezer, thought problem solved. It didn't even start to cut the smell of the skunk spray. So then I put it in a cooler, I taped the cooler shut. I put that in the freezer, didn't do anything. Um, I wrapped the cooler in plastic bags. I did three of these kitchen bags and then I did like outdoor trash bags, nothing. I mean, it was like I was standing right next to it. Um, and then we had a group that was coming for a hike. It was very awkward. So I had to find a place to put this container um, for the short term until I could figure out what I was going to do with it. Um, and so a week later, I opened it up. And as I started to unwrap it, um, this is what I found. So it looks like the vial never existed. There was no broken glass or anything. It all melted together into this big, sticky, nasty mess. Um, 
I contacted the guy that did the chemical workup of skunk spray because I figured this is a man who knows how to store this stuff. Um, and he told me, oh yeah, definitely. Uh, skunk spray is a hydrocarbon. It will melt plastic. If you light it on fire, it will burn. Um, and so what he thinks is that the test tube was lined with plastic um, and that the skunk spray basically ate away um, the, uh, the lining inside the lid, allowed it to leak out. It basically melted all of the plastic bags together into one ooey gooey mess. Um, and the whole thing had to be thrown away. So I had to get like special um, solvent um, Teflon lined containers to store this stuff. I have a new technique for gathering it so I don't expose myself any more than is necessary. Um, but it's a pretty incredible adaptation. I mean, and you're looking at an animal that lives in a really, really dangerous environment. And there are all these species around it that could kill it and eat them at any time, but they have developed this incredible system um, of defending themselves. Uh, and so I'll kind of leave a recognizable warning display to minimize the amount of time that they have to spray. Um, and that, yeah, it's just something they do when they absolutely have to. Um, and so with that, I will uh, end it. Um, I will give a little plug. We're having a researcher who's talking at the Karma Valley Library on Saturday, um, Hollis Woodard, who's an assistant professor at UC Riverside and she said he's native bees. Um, and it was kind of a last minute thing, so I wanna make sure she has a really nice audience. So if anybody's interested in that, um, there are directions on the Friends of the Carmel Valley Library website on how to access that Zoom meeting um, on Saturday morning. Um, and then Hastings, if anybody's interested in joining our mailing list, we are gonna start doing our public um, activities again as soon as Berkeley gives us the, um, the thumbs up to do that stuff, so probably in the fall. Um, and so we do have public events out here if anybody's interested. Um, you can follow that link and join our mailing list. And if you have questions, you can check our website or you can email me uh, through the Hastings Reserve at berkeley.edu email um, if you have questions about skunks or um, Hastings in general. So with that, uh, if anybody has questions, I am happy to answer. It was the perfect talk then, no questions. <laughs> I thought it was a fantastic talk. Thanks, Dr. Hunter. Here's a question for someone who's trying to build a house in the preserve. Is there something to stay away from that won't attract them to basically take over our house? Because no. they, they look kind of like bullies from what you demonstrated. Um, yeah, no, they, um, they're gonna go where they can eat. They're not, they have really big home ranges. They kind of cruise around. Um, they may pass through. They will nest in under decks. They will, so if you have, if you're building a deck or something, make sure to do like a hardware cloth around the perimeter to keep them out. Um, they, uh, they'll nest in down logs. They do that kind of stuff. They will forage in lawns. That's a big complaint. So prepare yourselves um, for that. Um, I mean, they're eating pests, but they destroy the lawn in the process. Uh, so there's no real surefire skunk avoidance technique. Um, they're, just, they're wonderful. You'll love them. It'll be great. <laughs> um, I have a question. Oh, sorry. You go ahead, Carl. Uh, sure. You? Okay. Oh, other Carl. Sorry. Uh, the other Carl. Sorry. There's two of us and we're neighbors in the preserve. Um, so our, our dog here in Los Altos has been skunked twice, uh, about, uh, about a month apart. And uh, the first time was terrible for her, of course. The second time, I think the skunk missed her, but it, uh, M-I-S-S-E-D, um, but it did get our cushions on our uh, outdoor furniture. Yeah. And there's definitely very like amber, orange colored spots on the cushion. Uh, do you have any suggestions for how we get rid of that? Um, like, you could not, try that. Put it in the washing machine. Yeah, you could try that. So if you Google the skunk remedy or whatever, um, you could try that. Okay. Yeah, and what that does is it denatures the proteins in those thiols that make the smell. Um, it does have hydrogen peroxide in it though, so it could discolor your cushions, but um, it's only 4% hydrogen peroxide, so maybe not, I don't know. It okay. might be worth testing a spot, but that would be the way. Um, okay. 
Otherwise, you just have to explain to anybody that comes over to your house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, great. And very good talk too, very enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, I'm wondering if they have such poor eyesight, how are they so accurate with spraying? Oh, that's a good question. Um, they typically are quite close to animals. So you saw that dog, that dog that went after that skunk actually grabbed it and then uh -huh. it sprayed. And then you can see how close it gets to that mountain lion to spray too. I mean, they don't, they are really good at detecting movement. So if you stand still, they're not, they have a harder time with that. But if you're moving around or something's moving around, um, then they have an easier time. They have more rods than cones basically. So they're better with the visual acuity and the, like the movement. Um, uh, and so that's, I assume how, how they manage to do that. But you can see how close they get to these animals before they spray them. It's, mm -hmm. They're not, they're capable of spraying at distance, um, but they don't always do it, if that makes sense. Gotcha. And then I do have another question. Um, what is it about their glands that protects them from their own noxious liquid? Good question. I think about this all the time. I mean, you essentially have these bags of poison inside your body um, and how, what are, what is the lining of the anal glands look like? How, how does that work? And I have no idea. Um, I, that is a question for somebody who has a lot more knowledge of like physiology and like tissue structure and stuff than I do. Um, but I think it's an excellent question because this stuff is so noxious. They don't spray each other. So if they get into a little fight, a little scuffle, they're not super territorial. So I don't imagine there's a lot of like skunk boxy matches happening out there, but if they get into a little scuffle, they fight it out. Like you would see, you know, a couple of foxes kind of tussling, fighting it out. They're not spraying each other. So it's like a, this gentleman's agreement um, between skunks not to nail each other. But I mean, you would imagine that mothers in the den have little ones who are just kind of spouting off all the time and they got to live with it. So I don't know, that stuff, that's super interesting to me. So I, I wish I had an answer for you on that, Alex, but I have no idea. Thank you. Jen, I'm sorry that we aren't all in person because I was laughing out loud multiple times during your talk, especially some of those videos. So um, I've got a question. Um, so if you were concerned about mountain lions while you're out hiking, what mimicry of skunks could we do? That's a great question. Uh, we can all dress like skunks all the time. <laughs> um, so, you know, when you're, in, if you encounter a mountain lion, what are they telling you to do? Like get big, make noise. You can like, you know, kind of throw your body towards it. And, and it's basically emulating. I mean, it's not designed to emulate a skunk defense, but that sort of, um, that posture, uh, that sort of aggressive posture is kind of the key part. Um, there are other things that are, so there's this, some group that's making, um, so for other warning colored animals, it, that signal works in a similar way. And so there is a, there's a company that's making wetsuits for surfers that emulate the coloration of a sea snake because um, sharks avoid sea snakes. Um, and, I'll do a quick zebra aside, because I think this is like one of the more interesting bits of research that's come out around coloration. Um, so we all think of zebras and we think of this disruptive effect of zebra coloration. You have a whole herd of zebras running and the lion can't decide where one zebra begins, the other zebra ends. Um, but that, and that may be part of the story, but that's not the whole story. So zebras are found in Eastern and Southern Africa, in Eastern Africa specifically, there's a problem with tsetse flies. So tsetse flies are a biting fly. Uh, they carry something called African sleeping sickness, which kills horses. So equids are for whatever reason, really susceptible to this disease. It's passed through these flies. Um, and so the researcher who was actually my grad school advisor um, set up traps uh, that were painted like zebras and traps that were just brown. And he never caught a tsetse fly in the zebra painted traps. And so zebras are horses. They should be equally susceptible to this disease as domestic horses. But 
it's something with the black and white coloration. It might be a heat issue with the reflection and absorption of, of the heat that the flies for some reason cannot locate a zebra and don't bite them. Um, and so there's a company that's making horse blankets that are colored like a zebra to try to keep flies off. So there's lots of things we can learn. I mean, it, it's really just a matter of time before we're all dressing in black and white all the time. And I have achieved my final goal, uh, <laughs> which is full integration of skunks into our society. Um, but yeah, there's lots of really cool ways that it's like this biotech mimicry thing um, where, where scientists are basically using the lessons of these sort of incredibly well-adapted species to inform how we operate um, to make a, a human, to improve human health and safety. I think I might go paint myself a skunk shirt. For See, there you go. Trails. Yeah, my greatest, I had a student, we had a class that was here um, a couple of weeks ago and I got a couple of groups that they were, it was a class run through um, UC Santa Cruz and they were here for two weeks and they were each of the, they were doing these little student research projects and I got two groups to do skunk projects, which I think is, I mean, it's what I'm here for. So <laughs> I think I, I did all that I came to do. Awesome. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions? You do other talks? <laughs> I do. I talk about Hastings. I need to come up with a good, like I, I've decided that I need to do more for the little guy. Like I want to do like a really good opossum talk, you know, like the species that we all think of as like the trash of the <laughs> animal community here. There are plenty of people to talk about mountain lions. And um, I've got a researcher from Berkeley that's interested in studying coyotes out here, which would be quite cool. Um, what about trash pandas? What's that? Trash pandas? Yeah, we, well, we don't have raccoons out here. What? I have never seen a person more excited. I got one, I've got one raccoon on a camera one time. And it was in a creek bed as it was drying up and it was going through and pulling the little steelhead fry out of um, these little pools. It's the only time I've ever gotten, and we have 28 cameras out. I've never gotten a raccoon out here. They're really rare on the preserve too. I've only, we've only seen kits once. On the well, it's crazy. Yeah, they're, they're not common. We probably yeah. have more than you guys, but yeah, we, we hardly see them. I, I actually you just have put, another question about. Oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead, Natalie. No, you go. I was going to say you just put an immigration ad in San Carlos, and you can get <laughs> tons of them to come down. <laughs> we'll get a little uh, pipeline going. I yeah. see him roadkill in the village sometimes, but that's it. Wow. Um, and another thing, sorry, Natalie. Natalie asked you a question. Sorry. No, I go ahead. I was just going to say the other thing that we don't have here that I'm anticipating we will have eventually are red foxes. We don't have any red foxes here. Um, and I get, I get them. Um, there are people in the village that have gotten them on trail cams. And I'm just kind of curious. I'd like to see, and maybe I will, I just hate using Facebook. So that's like the barrier for me. But um, I would like to see if people will send me their um red fox images and we can map out where they are because i'm really curious about that um and if they eventually make it out here and then how that affects us so anyway sorry natalie go ahead okay so um i heard another talk uh, about skunks on the radio one time and doesn't it take like doesn't it take like 30 minutes for them to recharge once they um kind of discharge their odor and then aren't they vulnerable during that time and so how come they keep chasing you know how come they kind of keep chasing when they've when they're kind of vulnerable well i have heard that they can spray seven to eight times per bout so they can spray and they can control how much they're releasing so if they don't let loose completely um, they have some reserve. Um, and so that's, I've always heard that. I haven't heard the 30 minute thing. And that could be that if they're completely depleted, it takes some time to regenerate enough to be useful. But if that were the case, I would be surprised that it was only 30 minutes. Um, so that's, I don't know. I, I haven't, I hadn't heard that before. Um, so that would be worth investigating. Well, this was a, this was a couple of years ago and I might, and we were in the car listening to this. And so I might, there's a very good chance that I got some of my facts um, um, mixed up. So don't get, don't take me, 
you know, don't take me at my oh, word. Oh, no, but, sure. Yeah. No problem. Um, but, but then, I mean, so I guess, so I guess you're saying that they protect themselves so they're not totally vulnerable. Right. Yeah. They can typically spray enough to get the job done. Um, and then again, like these animals are incapacitated once they've been sprayed. And so that was part of the rationale for my poorly thought out um, skunk spray experiment. Um, so one of the reasons that that smell might be attractive um, from a distance, so it's an attractant at low concentration, maybe because if they spray something, that animal is incapacitated, right? So um, if a skunk sprays a bobcat and the bobcat's temporarily blind and it's throwing up and it's miserable, like maybe a mountain lion smells that from a distance and is attracted to it and comes up and finds a bobcat that can't see and can't defend itself, in which case the skunk may have essentially it removed a potential predator from the landscape by spraying it because it was eaten by something bigger. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot potentially that could be going on um, that's slightly more complicated once you kind of get into the weeds about how all of this works and the impacts it has in the broader community. It was really fantastic, thank you. Good, no, I'm glad you enjoyed it. That was great. Sign us up for the encore. Good. <laughs> Jen, I'd love to put in a plug for a uh, wood rat talk. <gasps> yes, wood rats. Rat. Uh, they are, they're definitely the undervalued uh, yes. architects of the forest. Yeah. I have this fantasy. We have this little museum building here. These are the things I think about. Um, and I went to a museum in Oregon and they had this bee um like a beehive that was in the building but it had like a little tunnel where the bees could come and go so you could like watch the bees come in and like get yeah. in um and I thought that's what we need to do with wood rats like we need like a wood rat nest inside the building and then have like a little entrance and exit so the wood rat can like come and go and so you could have this whole thing that you could I think it'd be so cool they're so interesting it's incredible what they can do absolutely and they're adorable and they're not unfriendly I mean <laughs> trying to I'm going to be like one of those lunatics that has like one of every animal living in their house with them but <laughs> you know it's who I am <laughs> so uh, as long as we're on the discussion at the topic of rat like things we don't have mountain beavers in the preserve do we I wouldn't imagine so I mean I've heard, that, I've heard there's beavers in the upper Carmel watershed yeah but, but mountain beavers mountain not beavers, mountain beavers. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if we have any of those sorts of things our friends up in Seattle are just their entire hillsides being compromised by them. <laughs> I wondered if we had any such things. I don't know. I don't even know where the range is. I don't, I don't think, think so. I, I feel like they're, um, they're a bit more um, uh, like uh, high, like conifer forest. Like I imagine like a Northwest type scenario, maybe like Mendocino County, like Northern California. Um, I feel like they're more like very closed, like evergreen foresty type guys. I mean, I, I'm basing this on nothing but my feelings, um, but that that's, I've only ever encountered them in the Northwest. Impressive tunnelers. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, thanks folks. Thank sure you so is. much. Um, if that's all the questions we have, I think this is a good place to wrap up. Um, Thank you again so much, Dr. Hunter, for the lively discussion. Of, uh, I'm, I'm friends. Friends to do this. I get so excited in a group of people too. So like one time we'll be like be able to get real with it. It'll be fun. We'll have to get we'll have to have you back when uh, we can all meet in person and yeah. share our skunk love for there we go. With the with the rest of the preserve members. That's right. There you go. Awesome. Well, thanks guys. I really appreciate it. All right. Thank you very thank much. You. Appreciate right. it. Have a good night. Thanks for coming, everybody. Bye-bye.